Hello to you friends. This is Dhamma on air, in air, in open air. Number 11. There's nine questions. But first, the normal intro. Namo. Tasso. Bhagavato. Arahato. Samma Sambuddhasa. Worthy. Anabo and perfectly self-enlightened is the best Buddha. It's a little windy today, but I'd like to uh, get outside anyway, because I think it's a better recording. Uh, there was a problem with the sound last time. Uh, so I first like to thank all the donors who has provided uh, this new uh, sound recording equipment, uh, which ho hopefully will provide a uh, much better sound quality uh, when I learn to use it. This is the first time I use it, so we, we will see about that. But I think it, it, it will do. So thank you for the, to the kind donors, of which there was many. May they gain much merit therefrom. The first question is, how can I understand suffering? Dukkha. Uh, because this is the first noble truth, actually that all this and such is Dukkha. And if you understand the first noble truth, then you, the, the three other noble truths also uh, comes to an understanding. And you can say uh, the goal of Buddhist life is to understand to a complete degree the four noble truths, because that will eradicate ignorance. And, and eradication, elimination, irreversible, Elimination of all ignorance, all avidya. This is the same as enlightenment. So it's a very good question. How do I understand suffering? There's an easy way, actually, and that is reflection upon imper impermanence. So whatever object or state that comes in, uh, in, in one's life, giving one happiness, giving one's momentary happiness, and then one reflects upon this, ah, but this is not lasting. This is a catch-22. This is a baited hook. If I bite the hook, I'll have to pay the price later. So it's a very realistic view upon uh, the joys and happiness of worldly life. Because it is so, whether we take it on the very short time moment, that when the happiness from arising from a thing, from contact with the world, whether it's a lava, or is uh, money coming out of the ATM machine, or the new sport car, or uh, a new house or job or whatever, then uh, it has three phases, this happiness, from contact with worldly objects. When it, you contact the object, then the, the happiness rise. And as long as you have contact with the object, then it also stays on a plateau. But although all, already on the plateau, it starts to become boring. And boring is suffering. The boring state is suffering. It's not satisfaction. Then, of course, uh, the happiness starts to go down. And when it goes down, even though it's higher than before, then it's felt as frustration because the intensity of the joy, the gladness, the satisfaction is reduced. And then one compares to the higher state, not to the beginning of the this, of this session, the higher state. And then it's felt as, ah, now I'm losing my happiness. I'm losing the satisfaction. And then this is felt as frustration. And this is, of course, a kind of suffering. There's furthermore the catch-22 to understand that the more, uh, the more happiness you gain initially, the higher the fall afterwards. The more you fall in life with a love in, in love with life, with the object, with the lover, with the money, with the body, with the health, with youth, being young, being famous, the more you attach to it, the more you cling to it, the bigger the pain when the object goes away, when it vanishes. And it always goes away. It always vanishes. Why? Because everything in this world, every state, physical as mental, past, present or future, has always been, will always be, and is always also now impermanent, not lasting, not trustable, not safe. 
It's not something you can hang your hat on because the hat will fall down. So impermanence, in short, is the way to see suffering because it follows from impermanence that something one cannot keep, even though some devas they can keep their deva state for, for, for billions of years. But still, they, there's a price to pay afterwards. It's like somebody who says to you, ah, you can come into this amusement park, then you can have all the fun, try all the, the, the tricks there, and amuse yourself all day long. Come along. Then one comes along. Then one amuses one inside the amusement park of the world. Then was in the evening one wants to pass out, one is tired. And then they say, ah, you have anything to pay? But I thought it was free, one says. Huh? I thought it was for free. But that's not the case. The more happy one becomes with the contact with the world, the more unhappy one becomes when losing the contact with the world. And the world always becomes otherwise than the world you fall in love with. Whether it's a body, or somebody else's body, whether it's a house or whatever object it is, physical or mental. So impermanence is a way to see, easy way to see suffering. Just reflection on this. This is a daily reflection. Anicca anusati. Reflection upon impermanence, transience, evanescence. Worldly happiness, uh, uh, momentary happiness, and uh, transient happiness is kind of like uh, you take up some water in your hand and then you try to carry it along. But you cannot carry water along in your hand. It, it spills out, it, it's lost. Or sand in your in your hand also his fingers it, it runs out bet between the fingers. It's a futile project. Nevertheless, it's a project of all beings in the in the universe. And it's first when they see that this impermanence, by the told by the Buddha, that there is this four noble truth, that they are able to exit the universe and exit this transient a world of cyclic existence, rebirth, aging, sickness, decay, death, rebirth, and so on. So this is a way to see suffering, impermanence, reflection upon impermanence, anicca. Question two. Adultery induces next rebirth as homosexual. Uh, what, from what text is that? And are there other karmic uh, causal relationships in the text? There are plenty. And this particular one is one from a, a book called Panchagata Dipani. Panchagati, uh, the five ways to go, the five destinies. Uh, as, in short, Deva, divine being, human being, animal being. Uh, this was three. Peta, hungry ghost and hell being. This is a five levels, very rough. Panchakalti Pani, manual. Manual in the five destinies. The lower, the human, and the higher. There is mentioned. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's translated by an Hasselby, uh, an Australian uh, classic philologist for some years ago. And it's, uh, it's published in the Paleotech Society's journal. Uh, I'll give a link below. Then there's two other books that are interesting from a comic point of view. Uh, this is Vimana Vattu, uh, where, where Mahamukayana, one day in the afternoon, thought to himself, ah, what if I go up to the devas and, dev and ask them, what did they do to become devas, to become divine? Then he uh, goes to the Buddha and asks permission, and the Buddha says, ah, that's a good idea. Please do, Mahamukhyana. And then he does. And he, he asks many devas and all their explanations about what they did when they were human beings uh, to become devas. Uh, these are explained in this book. It's a very thin one. Vimanna Vattu. Then there's Peta Vattu. He, he do the same another day. He asks himself, what if I go down and ask all the hungry ghosts uh, what they did to become hungry ghosts? What they are main kamma was that they determined their destiny as a downfall 
and he again asks uh, the Buddha permission, and the Buddha he gives permission uh, to go down and ask the hungry ghost. This is also a fairly thin one. It's published in the Pelis Society. There's two English translations. They are fairly good. Little uh, old-fashioned, but nevertheless fairly good. I'll also give links below. Uh, I've made uh, some three Dharma speeches on car mechanics and the working of Skamma. But I'll make, make one more on uh, this because it's a good idea uh, to get a handle on what effect, what Kamma, uh, what Kamma here makes the effect, the destiny here. What is the relation between Kamma, uh, intentional action here, whether it's verbal action, uh, mental action, or physical action here in this life? What does it, how does it influence, and which result do you have in the next life or in this life? Uh, so I'll make a whole, a whole, probably a series about it. There's a, extremely many examples mentioned in the classical text uh, about it. And there's a monk here who recently have summarized it uh, very neatly. And I will use his uh, summarize uh, as a ground text to explain here all the examples mentioned in the text in a, in a compressed way. They did this and that, then this and that happened to them as a comic result. They did this and, they, this and that, and then uh, they got this and that rebirth. So that's a good subject to get to learn about it. There's a specificity between the action and the result of the action. It's the action, the intentional action, the, or the intention behind the action, actually, that is called the kamma. The result of the action is called vipaka, or falla, fruit. Technical expressions. Question three. When we are born again as humans, are we born into the future, or can we be born into the past? No, one cannot be bo born in, reborn into the past. One can only be reborn into the future. So that's very simple. The rebirth is instantaneous. It happens right after the death moment. So there's no inter intervening period as, uh, as some uh, Buddhist sects, uh, they teach that they're a kind of a bardo state where you are in between two lives. No, the bardo state uh, is a misapprehension that they are also, this is also a kind of, of life. It can be short, can be long, uh, can be conscious, can be unconscious. Uh, so there's no, there's no intervening period. It happens right at the moment, right at the next moment of consciousness. This is the dead moment. Then the very next moment of consciousness uh, is the rebirth moment where the transmigration has taken place. I hope this answers this question. Question four. Is attachment to, to jhana meditation, to jhana, to the absorptions, is that also an attachment? Is that also clinging? And why are this uh, not detrimental? It is actually, yes, it is clinging. It's attachment to a mental state, very pleasant mental state. It's the same as attaching to taking heroin uh, or smoking, uh, smoking opium or taking morphine or something like that. But it's not disadvantageous. Why not? Because it leads to Nibbana. While opium and <laughs> morphine, they, it leads the other way around. So there's two kinds of desire, the Buddha said. One kind of desire is detrimental, is disadvantageous. That is basically sense desire. Desire to see something, hear something, smell something, taste something, touch something, and have a particular mental state or thought. This detrimental, disadvantageous. Then there's an advantageous desire. This is the desire to reach Nibbana. And everything that goes with this desire is also advantageous. And since jhana, Meditation is a way to reach Nibbana, not the full way, but it's a stepping stone along this way. This is also a, a advantageous, good form of desire. However, that said, it can't be a, it can't be a stumbling block because if you have reached one absorption, uh, a one state that goes for all the states along the Noble Eightfold Path, Whatever state it is, it can, it can kind of like saying, ah, now I reach so high, and then you put the uh, head on the pillow of complacency. 
I don't need to do any further. But the job has maybe only just begun. And then, of course, it's not very advantageous uh, to, to, to put the effort down, stop the effort. There's still some striving to do. So jhana meditation can induce attachment and clinging, yes, but it's still advantageous. Why so? Because it leads to Nibbana. However, it still can be a stumbling block, so it's kind of like a stagnation point, where you reach first jhana, then you cannot go on to next jhana, second jhana, because you, you love first jhana so much. Then once uh, the classic text, they will say, ah, then you look upon, the cure is to look upon the jhana as impermanent. Only one thought, uh, one, then you're out of the jhana again because you're disturbed, you're distracted. So it's a very fragile state, very difficult to attain and very, very easy to lose. It takes only like that. That's the suffering inside the jhana. Again, it's impermanence that do does the trick. Then one see, ah, okay, this jhana, however pleasant it is, however interesting it is, however hypnotic it is, however fantastic it is, however peaceful it is, it is still a kind of suffering. I have to go on to the next one. I have to find something better than that. Something more safe, something more stable, something more lasting. Question five. How can lay people attain deeper peace, deeper calm, while still craving for primitive things like sex, drugs and rock and roll? That's a good question. Uh, it takes practice. Meditation is uh, uh, the thing to do. So one gains another pleasure. One get, have another pleasure in one's life. So the amount of pleasure in one's life is the same. One kind of like put down the primitive pleasure and then gets a higher pleasure. So one swaps the primitive with something refined. How to uh, stop having craving for sex and having craving for, for any kind of sense desire, for food, for example, or for drugs? That's the, the classical trick there is asupa, disgust meditation, on corpses or on the skeleton. Uh, one chooses typically one's of one's own gender, so it's not a sexual object. And then one meditates on the skeleton from the top of one's head down to the toe, one's own skeleton, or one uh, sees pictures of corpses, the more repulsive, the more shocking, the more disgusting they are, then one photographically memorizes these doing meditation. Uh, this uh, brings the desire down. That's one thing. And also it gives fearlessness. One becomes fearless of death even. And that's a very pleasant state. Uh, very, you feel very safe, that not even death uh, can judge you. It doesn't matter whether you die or not. You're doing the right thing, so you just keep doing it. Whether death comes or not, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It can be party time, even. Looking forward to death, because you know you are going this way, not that way. This will gradually uh, induce this peace. And also having uh, to see that this running around for pleasure, this pleasure here, this pleasure there, out on the bars at night to seek, seek a new sexual partner, uh, going to work every day uh, to keep up uh, the bank account, uh, to pay all the bills, uh, how much suffering there is in that. The stress of it, the continuous stress of this push that you have to do it, you feel compelled to do it. Even though you can see it's stressing, you still feel compelled to do it. Why? Because of attachment to lay life, to sense desire, basically. To being able to go down to the supermarket and buy whatever kinds of uh, pleasure you want. The second thing I would say is a good thing for lay people to do is to keep uh, the prayer days, the observance days, the positive days, every new moon and 14 days after every full moon Keep them clean. Put on the white clothes. Don't have sex on that day. Don't use perfume on that day. So keeping the eight precepts. Don't eat eat after uh, eat afternoon. It's a good practice. This will bring something else. 
into the life and lift up the layperson out of this mud that is like an elephant who has fallen into a pit full of mud. It cannot come up. It stands there with the feet on the brink, but the back end of the elephant is still in the mud. Even after this elephant, this layperson has seen the Dhamma, it's difficult to come out of this mud hole of lay life, which is difficult, stressful, non-peaceful, a continuous hunt of deadlines, bosses, bank accounts, bills that has to be paid, worries, aging, decay, sickness and death. In short, suffering. So, meditation in general, discussed meditation on corpses, skeletons in particular, and then keeping the poor days clean by eight precepts. Every new moon, every full moon. That's the way to do it. What did Buddha say about euthanasia? Uh, of humans and animals. He didn't say anything, as far as I know. He said something about suicide. Uh, there were three monks in the text that committed suicide. And they were... He went and saw the corpses and uh, evaluated the situation that they have all attained Nibbana before uh, dying, before breathing out. Usually they will cut their they are either their throat or both their wrist with the, the, their uh, razor knife and then bleed out. And when they are bleeding out, then they can see the suffering of life and then they have attained nibbana in all three cases. So he said that their, their, their suicide was blameless. In all other cases, it's suicide futile and blameful. Because why? Because your problem starts, it doesn't become smaller by committing suicide. That's the whole idea. I can be uh, free from the suffering of life about my own state by, by killing myself, yes, but on the other side it starts again. And often much worse, often on a lower degree of freedom, lower ability to solve the problem. Uh, my own look at it as, a, as euthanasia and active death help, uh, which is a fact in the hospital, and some, somehow has to be, because you can keep people alive uh, with machines and medicines today in a situation where they, where, which is very painful for them. So what to do about it is an ethical problem. Uh, after becoming Buddhist, I've changed uh, my mind, because actually you can say, uh, before I would take the uh, approach that uh, it, a, a person who's terminally ill and is uh, within, let's say, a few days of dying. The purpose of a doctor is to uh, help them to die in a peaceful and painless uh, way. So one should help the patients to, to die in a, in, a, in a peaceful and painless way. And that's the purpose of, of these medications one gives. But uh, on the other hand, being a Buddhist now, I see that actually like these monks that were dying and saw the suffering of life while they were bleeding out. It takes some minutes to bleed out. Actually, it was this suffering, seeing this suffering, that uh, just make them uh, progress just along, kind of like detached from all life by seeing this suffering. And then attain Nibbana right there and right then, before their death. So, uh, actually, one should not take the suffering out of people's mouth because that's what shows them Nibbana. That is what pushing them along. That's what uh, makes them do progress along the noble way towards Nibbana. So it can be kind of like a balance, one could say. Uh, in general, I would say that uh, euthanasia is, is uh, very, very rarely necessary. Uh, but sometimes it is. And if it's of humans, then uh, as a doctor, I would say it's always best to uh, have uh, the agreement between the patient uh, who's going to die and the doctor and all the family and all the other uh, health workers that are surrounded this person. But uh, it's a tricky issue 
uh, because uh, they are already where they have active death help. For example, in Switzerland, there is also people who have uh, got help to commit suicide. Uh, for example, there was a 20, 29 year old woman with a depression, and that was a disease with a depression, only depression. And people can be cured from depression, it's not a terminal illness. Nevertheless, in Switzerland, at this particular hospital, she got medicine to take her own life. And that was wrong. This, she shouldn't have had this medicine. The doctors in this case misevaluated her case. And I think this was unethical. A 20 year, 29 year old woman who is physically healthy, but has a depression, which is a curable disease, should not have access to a lethal medicine. For sure, for sure not. Other, in other institutions in Oregon, uh, in the United States, they have a whole system there, and uh, there's a, I've written a lot of research about it, uh, where doctors and pharmacists and the patients, and they work together uh, in a teamwork. And they are, uh, you actually get two portions of medicines, glass of medicine, so you can take your own life for these patients who are terminally ill. This is typically uh, brain cancer, uh, lung cancer in the final stages, as a, or can be very painful diseases uh, in the brain cancer case where you have epilepsy, constant uh, cramps and, uh, and seizures, uh, such cases as that, which are really terminal, which where their death is, uh, which are incurable, that the disease is irreversible. It cannot be cured in any other way. This has to pass two doctors that has to sign that this, this disease really is incurable. And this, uh, the 20-year-old 20, 20 uh, woman from Switzerland, she would not have passed in Oregon uh, in the laws there. Uh, but I think you should, uh, one should be allowed to die in a worthy way. Uh, and uh, dying in hospital is not particularly worthy. And I, even being a doctor myself, I, I would not like to die in the hospital. Uh, I would like to die here in, in nature, uh, uh, by myself, by my own uh, uh, natural way. So, so uh, there should be space for it, but one should be very careful about it, very careful about it. The, the research written about it uh, is noteworthy that, that of these patients who got, uh, there were 600 in this study who got this medicine, get two portions. Uh, only one third actually used the medicine, but the two other thirds had the, they had the knowledge that when they were ready to do it, and usually they prepare themselves, they collect the families, uh, they know where they should die in the bedroom and so on, and they have prepared where they should be buried and all the, all the things are put in order. Then they know uh, when I cannot accept the, the conditions of this ailing body, that is falling apart, that is cancer is gro coming, growing out of my body or bleeding or whatever, and it's so painful that I cannot, then I can't take this medicine. But uh, in, they only did in, in one third of the cases, in 30% of the cases. In the 60% of the cases, they actually died from natural cause. Uh, and this, I think, is, is, is a good knowledge to weigh, is that, that, that there is an open door. Because I also seen patients as a, and the hospital that's kind of like getting, uh, when you end up in the intensive care unit, uh, then you lose your integrity. You cannot take any decisions for your, for your own life or your own body because it's in the hand of the doctors. You cannot talk because you have a tube in your throat and uh, you're unconscious and so on. So you're administered by somebody else. And this can be very painful for them to be in the intensive care unit. Uh, so there should be, uh, in order to not come there, people should say, I, I don't want to go there. I want to take uh, my life in my own hand. And this I have a right to do. And this I agree in. People have a right to terminate their own life uh, if there is a, a weighty situation for it. And we as doctors, we should help with that uh, when it's relevant. And there should be very sharp distinction between when it's relevant and when it's not relevant, when it's necessary and when it's not necessary. It's only for terminally ill, dying patients, which has a situation that cannot be cured, 
or uh, relieved in any other way. And there are some cases of that. There are not many, but there are cases, both of young people and of elderly people. But uh, being depressed is not an indication for euthanasia. That's for sure. I hope this answers these questions. Uh, question seven, should one participate in actively in politics if there are political wrongdoings that makes people suffer or being suffer, we can say in general? Of course, no. Of course, no. And uh, I think uh, the right way to do politics is to purify yourself. When you purify yourself, mentally speaking, your behavior becomes uh, better. Your speech becomes better. You become a more admirable person. Then other looks at you, they do the same. So you are doing actively politics by purifying yourself. It's the best way you can help the world is to purify your own mind. And this is about party politics, forget about that. It has nothing to do with it. Party politics cannot repair war. It's, it's evident in the world today. Huh? In a situation in Syria, everybody fights with everybody. And all the big nations are involved there. And everybody is bombing everybody. And refugees are flooding uh, Europe and all over the world. Big issue. Why is that? Because it's because of hate. It's because of anger of the people in that region for a long time, for ages. Even at Buddhist time, it was known that people in the Middle East, they had an angry temperament. Uh, so the karmic uh, is said that the karmic accumulation in in this area, and I think it's because it's so hot and dry, and it's very difficult to live there, because you cannot harvest anything, you cannot grow anything. It's a desert. And this, I think, makes people fight more about the very few resources that they are actually available. Now there are many resources, there are oil, uh, but there hasn't been for a long time. So it's kind of like this uh, hate in a society that uh, gives up uh, People are reborn in the same society. That they have bring their hate with them, and the effects of the hate. And this means that there, there has been problems there for two thousand years, uh, and it will probably uh, remain so for a significant uh, period, as long as beings in the area, uh, and they are starting to starting to see it. Some of my supporters live in this area, live in the Middle East, come from a Muslim background, but have converted to Buddhism say, oh, we don't want to participate in this war. We don't want to participate in this fighting and in all this hate, all this conflict. We withdraw and try to purify ourselves, try to make our own mind peaceful. Then we go to job and, and act peacefully there. Then our colleagues will see, ah, they are peaceful people. Uh, they, this is impressive. We also want to be civilized like them, elegant like them then they also uh, take up mental purification. So uh, politics, the highest and best politics is self-purification. Party politics, forget about it. It's like a boxing fight and uh, mud slinging and not much else, actually. Here's a person who wants to quit alcohol and tobacco. Is there any medicine uh, or meditation uh, one can use to, to quit uh, alcohol and tobacco? I first like to say something as from a doctor point of view. Uh, it's frequent and rational attention given to the dangers in alcohol and tobacco. And the dangers are real. Uh, this is obvious. We once, I was working at a, a large uh, commune hospital in Copenhagen uh, city, where we got uh, more or less half the city's uh, lower social status uh, people in. And there was something like uh, 200 or 300 uh, people admitted to the hospital uh, for, for uh, intensive care or long time care per day. So it was a busy place actually. Then we counted how many of these uh, patients that are coming in uh, every day, how many are they f uh, stemming from uh, problems from alcohol or tobacco? That is uh, uh, chronic bronchitis, for example, lung cancer, uh, cardiac uh, problems, uh, problems with the, uh, with the arteries, so on. 
how many of, of these, and this was kind of like 50%. So 50% of the patient intake, uh, intake on a big hospital in any part of the Western world is basically problems that people have put upon themselves uh, by smoking or drinking or eating too much. 50%. So there's a se severe danger, severe danger. And usually one cannot repair it. Lung cancer is not repairable. Chronic bronchi bronchitis, cold, uh, chronic obstructive lung disease cannot be repaired. It's a terrible death. You cannot breathe. So you, you die by having a feeling that you, you cannot breathe, that you're being choked. Uh, so uh, it's reflection upon this these dangers of the situation. This is something that one that can kill one slowly and will do if one doesn't stop. Uh, secondly, one loses a lot of money uh, on buying alcohol and uh, cigarettes. And thirdly, uh, while intoxicated with alcohol, one does foolish things, comically foolish things, sometimes catastrophic things. So it's reflections of this dangers, atinava, reflection on the danger that one can, can bring one out uh, of, this, of this dirt, of this addiction. It is difficult. It is difficult. Both alcohol and alcohol, you have, if you have drink alcohol for a long time, you have to have medicine. Otherwise, you get uh, delirium tremens, which is a deadly disease in 80, 80, kinds, 80 percent of the cases. So they have to have medicine and uh, long life support in AA and anonymous alcoholics or similar, or use the 12 steps uh, where there also are Buddhist component in the end. So you exchange one kind of pleasure again with another kind of pleasure, another kind of happiness, which is more peaceful and more advantageous. And then you can skip the drug. But you cannot skip the drugs that gives you this mental peace without having something something else. So that's where Buddhism comes in. So you throw away the cigarettes and the alcohol gradually, then you increase the peaceful living that is a, a result of a Buddhist uh, life standards. And then you can, you get some pleasure and some peace here that you got before from the drugs. Then you don't need the drugs anymore. You don't need the cigarette. Uh, but uh, going out of it, this cold turkey feeling, it's difficult, difficult, but not, impo not impossible. Keep trying. This one thing, again, uh, this is this disgust meditation, meditation on corpses, skeletons, rotten corpses, that is good to do for people who are uh, addicted to a mental state, this calm, momentary calm that uh, both cigarettes and uh, alcohol gives. So one sees this body, one can pull, pull oneself out, whatever. But there's no kind like, it's not a quick fix. There's no quick fix uh, for addiction, uh, these very strong addictions as to cigarette and alcohol. Uh, for cigarettes, one also uh, can use uh, nicotine plasters and nicotine gum in the, uh, in the two or three months uh, just after quitting for helping with the uh, nicotine receptors up in the brain that has been upregulated. For alcoholic, uh, one has to have medicine, go to a doctor and get medicine because they have to have medicine. It's dangerous to them to quit drinking if they are heavy drinkers uh, and have been for a long time, and then to quit without medicine. So they have to have medicine. They have to go to a doctor. They have to go to a center where they have take care of alcoholic. So it's also something about having this right social relations. And then in the end, Buddhism will drag one out by giving something else, by providing some peace, some relief and from this craving and hunting that is inevitable in any kind of addiction. If Mara is the evil one, question eight, Mara is a... Uh, the Buddhist word for Satan, for the Christian Satan, it's a real individuality, uh, living on level 11, uh, where he's a rebel. If he's an evil one, they say, 
uh, how can he do these bad actions without uh, falling? Uh, he can't do because uh, he doesn't do anything himself. He only tries to persuade others to do something. And that is, on his level, Parinimitta uh, Vasavati Deva. They have power over others' creations, others' uh, mental formations and physical actions. So they have power over what one thinks, what one says, and what one do. And they get, gain pleasure from seeing other beings doing something. They get pleasure from seeing other ones having sex, kinky sex, or whatever, or do something. So we are part of their computer game. We are part of their gaming experience. They're not all evil. Most of them are good, actually. But uh, this guy, he's uh, seething the evil, the psychopathic, unfortunately extremely intelligent and powerful. The Buddha said he was the most powerful. But uh, he only kind of like induces uh, the temptation to do this or that. Then the person themselves uh, agrees with it and then does it. So the person themselves forms an intention. And this is their karma then. This doesn't, he, he doesn't pay for that. He pays for his intention. He denies that. Uh, but he, he doesn't kill persons, even though he are able to do it. Just like that. Uh, why? Because he knows if he physically harm other beings, then he fall. Uh, but he, he have kind of like persuaded himself, if, if he only whispers them in the ear to do this or that, then he, it doesn't count karmically. But that's not correct. It does, it does count. It does count comically. But since he has ended up there by doing something very, very, very good, it's a counterbalance. But in all cases, it stands in the text, and in unambiguously, all martyrs, they end up going to hell. They have to do barbecue time. All of them, unambiguously. So uh, the one who is there now, he will also have to do barbecue time. He denies that fact. But so also do many on the human level. They deny that fact. So it's an accumulation. Huh? You can do evil until you come to the death moment. And then is where you fall. It doesn't fall before until it's, unless it's very, very evil. There's a story about uh, Mahamukayana. And he was, uh, he had been, uh, he had been Mara before. And uh, he was the uncle of the one who's Mara now, who was in Mukayana's stomach. And he said, Mukayana, come up. And he says, Mara, come up. You have nothing to do there. And then Mara come up and sat on another tree. And then uh, he said, uh, Mukayana told him, I, when at this at that time, I was Mara. I was, as your position, called Dusi. And then I went after Buddha Kasapa and one of his pupil. And I tried to persuade them to do this and that, but I couldn't. Then I become so angry that I throw a stone in the head of the disciple who was walking behind uh, Kasapa Buddha. So the blood was flowing down, but they, even, they didn't even notice me. They didn't want to pay me any attention. Uh, and then I fell right into hell right there. And so that's an example. You, if you, they do physically evil to other beings, then they can fall from their state uh, instantaneously. Uh, and then he explained to, out of compassion, to the Mara who is there now, who was his nephew, that uh, he was transfixed up through the legs and out through the arms, up through his anus and out through his mouth, and then with a, a, a spear, glowing spear, inside here and from the other side. And then they told him, when these, uh, these two uh, hot iron rods at this size, they go slowly towards each other. When they meet each other inside your heart, you you have been here for 10,000 years. And he told this to Mara to try to convince him that what he was doing was evil. But even that didn't convince him. What can then convince him? And that also is the same for hu at the human level. What can convince people about their evil doing? What can? Sometimes you cannot. In many cases, you cannot convince them about anything. So be it. They have to pay a price then. Then it's too late. Question nine. Uh, what drives makes karma manifest as good or bad? Why is it so that good intention brings good result? 
and bad intention brings uh, bad results. Sometimes we can see that this is not the case. Uh, so this person uh, actually thinks that, that that's ask whether why if you have a good intention and what is good intention why does it bring a good result a good future and vice versa why does a bad bring a bad one and why doesn't the result when he see uh, beings doing good and bad out in the world why doesn't they gain immediate result that's because of the delay so there's a delay from the action uh, the action here and to the result of the action later on. So it takes time. And even if you do, as long as you have, let's say, say you do something good or bad here, they say, ah, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing, and until it happens, I say, ah, now something happened. But then you have forgot the cause. And this delay between cause and effect is what confuses beings. But there's always a result, and it always corresponds to the action. In general, what is it that makes uh, good actions give a good future and bad actions give a bad future? You can say it's a kind of disharmony. It's just a mirror reflection, actually, of probabilities of events. If you uh, induce other beings to have pain, then pain comes back. So it's a reflection of the state. If you give other beings pleasure by giving them food, then pleasure comes back. So nature works like a mirror. It's a passive thing, passive mechanism. On the other hand, if you... So, so it's, there's nothing mystical or metaphysical about it, actually. It's just a reflection of intentional uh, information that comes back the same way it went into the mirror, then it comes back out the mirror the same way it went in. So uh, good in, good out. Bad in, bad out. Good begets good, evil begets evil. The mirror works uh, like that because there's some information that is consistent. Truth, for example, is consistent with itself. What a, a true statement says something is, it is really so there. An untrue statement says something that is inconsistent. And that's on the information level, it, it creates a conflict that you say, ah, it's like this, and then it's like that. Then there's a, some conflict in nature. And this gives these this echoes uh, of, uh, of pain back. What is, how do you define intention, whether it's good or bad? That's a rule of thumb, very easy. Uh, but uh, easy to say, but not to see in practice. If the intention is colored by or contains any kind of ignorance, any kind of greed, any kind of hate, then it's a, a bad intention, an evil intention. And if it's performed, it's carried out, then it will, the, the result of it, will, the comic result of it will later be pain, suffering, frustration. However, if it's a good intention, that's no ignorance, that is, that is understanding. There's no greed, that is, there's, there's generosity, detachment. And there's no hate, that, that, that there's good, goodwill and friendliness. Then the result of that intention, of that action, of that karma, that will later on be pleasure, be happiness, be harmony for that particular acting individual. I think this is enough for today. Uh, I'll give some links on the karma, uh, relation between karma, and then I will uh, make in the future uh, a whole, probably a whole video series about uh, karma, or karma, as we say. Karma is a, a Sanskrit word, and karma is a Pali word. Uh, so the causal relations between, the causal relationship between uh, action, intentional action, karma, and the effect of action, whether it's in this life or in later life or in the transmigration moment, the, uh, affecting the destinies of the transmigration. And I'll take as many uh, examples I, as I can and skim them from the texts and then uh, present them in a preserved way.
so people can get a handle on it by learning from this example. 55 minutes and 49 seconds. Enough for today. Looks like storm is coming up. Namu. Tasso. Bhagavatto. Arahatto. Samma Sambuddhasa. Worthy. Honorable. And perfectly self enlightened. Is the bliss Buddha. Thank you for your attention. And again, thank you to the donors for this sound recorder. May many beings become thus happy thereby. Thank you.